Just cause you want to feel the open road doesn't mean you want to hear it. Firestone Weather Grip Tires with less noise for quiet comfort. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Mario Andretti is a racing icon. Born in Italy, Mario emigrated to the United States when he was just 15. At the age of 19, he began racing stock cars in Pennsylvania. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the start of his illustrious career. His achievements are legendary. The world watched as he won the Daytona 500, the Indy 500, and ultimately a Formula One World Championship. An impressive trifecta. No other race car driver in history has won all three titles. Throughout his five-decade career, Mario took the checkered flag 111 times and was added to the list of living legends at the Library of Congress. Welcome to Johnny G and Friends. I'm Johnny G, and on today's podcast, we're joined by the greatest race car driver ever, my good friend, Mario Andretti. Mario, welcome to the show. Thank you, Johnny G. Thanks for including me in your series. Well, it's a pleasure, my friend. Time of you. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, Mario, Kim and I have two questions we ask each other every day. What do you want for dinner tonight? And... What do you want to watch on TV? So while she was cleaning up the dinner dishes last night, I went over to my TV. I scrolled down to my tape shows. And on the bottom, I have some that are marked keep. Okay. And, and uh, there it was. Drive like Andretti. So we were able to watch your show last night again. And, you know, I must say, you've really had a full life, my friend. And we especially enjoyed you watching growing up in Italy and all the great stories you shared on the program. Well, indeed, obviously, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, to take the cruise back to uh, my hometown. I mean, my hometown, my town of birth, uh, which is now Croatia. Uh, it was Italy before the war, the second war. Anyway, uh, so that was the beginning of my life. And, uh, and right after the war, we had a choice, you know, that uh, our zone, our area was occupied by communist Yugoslavia. So there was a choice to maintain the entire Italian citizenship, uh, uh, we became refugees in our own country. In, uh, so we were refugees in Luca, Tuscany for seven years. And in 1955, um, while well, my dad uh, applied for visas uh, in 1952 at the suggestion of an uncle that we had here in America, and uh, the visas came through three years later. So my, my dad said, well, looks like we're going to America. And then... Um, so we were all sort of a, a bit surprised, as you can imagine, even though we, we knew that was in play. But uh, he said, that ah, looks like we're maybe we'll go there for five years and then come back. <laughs> and so that, is, that was how he broke it to us. And, um, and that's it, you know, then uh, so we left. Why, why Nazareth, Pennsylvania? Why, why, why of all places? Because we had an uncle uh, on my mother's side who uh, lived here. And, he's, uh, and to obtain visas, you had to have someone that would guarantee that you would have a place to stay, a home or whatever. And, um, and that's it. That was the reason why we went up in Nazareth. And I'm still here, by the way. Well, that's great. That's great. I know you have a beautiful place up there. So, you, Mario, you've raced for five decades. You're always staying on top of technology. You've seen a lot of changes over the years. You've lived through a technology evolution. In today's world, how would you say how much is winning races is driver talent and how much is having a, a good car with sophisticated technology? Well, uh, I think the combination is always the same. It's just that today you have a lot more information. Um, you know, the, at the beginning of my career, like, you know, even through the 70s, 80s, uh, before the computer, there was a lot of guesswork going on. And, um, and of course, you know, the engineers were... Uh, putting the numbers to things, but they were still guessing. And then when the computer came on, you know, back in about the middle 80s, uh, I think we were one of the first uh, uh, indie cars to actually be instrumented. Uh, and we did some testing at Romeo Grounds in Michigan, Ford Proving Grounds. And, uh, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden we started putting a number and a name to everything, like uh, uh, suspension deflections and everything else. And, uh, and then, of course, then, 
with telemetry, the engineers could read everything that was going on while you're out there on the track, you know, the, the steering curves and everything else and loadings. And so, you know, uh, and here again, you know, in those days, for instance, um, you, no one knew, uh, uh, except the driver, feeling if, it, if you had a puncture. Now the engineer sees it immediately and they give you a warning before it becomes a, a big issue. So um, again, uh, you have more information, but uh, uh, the bottom line, what the needs of to be able to have the ultimate performances uh, are still the same. You know, the, uh, the driver needs, uh, uh, you know, a, a piece of equipment that's capable of getting the job done. And it's up to the driver to extract 100% of what you have under you. And that's it. So your partnership with Firestone, a company I worked for my whole career, spans uh, over five decades. Yeah, I love the shirt, man. I love it. <laughs> Uh, I remember us traveling, Mario, across North America from city to city, U.S., Canada, especially during the time of 2000 to 2002. We spent a lot of time together on the road. You know, in the 20 plus years I've known you, Mario, I've never asked you this question. Why did you put your reputation, the Andretti name, on the line for us during the recall? Well, when I was going to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to assess this uh, recall situation and be able to be basically um, a, a spokesperson alongside of you, um, I looked at a lot of facts. Uh, first of all, you know, as you know, I've had the vast experience of working with Firestone, uh, understanding and knowing the culture of the company and the pride that went on in everything and uh, and appreciation of the technology that uh, had been developed uh, over the years. So I had that confidence factor, but <clears throat> by, well, I had to look at facts. And when we looked at the facts about uh, the accidents that uh, were causing some of these issues uh, with the Ford Explorer, there was really a big issue with the vehicle itself. Because uh, as we know, uh, the Chevy Blazer had the same tires and it was really a facsimile vehicle and they had no issues and why it just the bottom line was the Ford Explorer had a recommended pressure of 28 pounds and the, and the Chevy Blazer had a recommended pressure of 35 pounds. Big well, difference. When, when, yeah, but big difference, Johnny G, because when you have 28 pounds recommended, that means most of the life of the tires will be running in the low 20s, because people don't check pressures, unfortunately. And uh, <clears throat> every accident was high speed, overload, and uh, high temperature, and extreme low inflation of the tires, sometimes some of the vehicles below 20, 20 pounds. So again, knowing those facts, I went in there with no problem uh, talking with the dealers, as you know, I don't think Firestone lost a single dealer throughout this whole uh, situation. And uh, so anyway, we, uh, we had a story to tell, which was uh, factual. And, um, and that's it. And that's all. That's what I have. We were armed with that. And, uh, and I watched you operate the relationship you had with every dealer. I think it was uh, a paramount. Uh, they trusted you. And, um, and that's it. We didn't go out there and, uh, and uh, try to, um, you know, to, 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 to say anything, to, to represent anything that wasn't true. So, uh, and uh, that was it. So in that respect, it looks like uh, uh, we did a pretty good job. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. And it was great having you on my side there because it was some tough times early on. And uh, yeah, of course, but uh, I think we felt the customers in the audience uh, were all behind us, you know, and uh, not one customer ever called me during the whole crisis and said, you guys got a problem with your tires. So that also gave me the confidence uh, of knowing that, hey, uh, if there was a problem, they'd be calling me at the time. And uh, I was vice president. So um, yeah, I, I totally agree. But thanks for being on my side through this whole thing. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. yeah. it was interesting. So, time. so you, uh, you helped Bridgestone uh, develop racing tire technology and have been a long time test driver for Firestone, especially early on in your career. You even helped develop the race tires that led to your wins on the track. What it is about innovating with Firestone that still is a point of pride for you today? 
Well, for me, it was just phenomenal to be part of the test team. Uh, it worked for me personally because uh, uh, through uh, having had so many miles under my belt, you know, uh, trying all the different tires, I learned so much about how to find, how to this, this, uh, uh, be able to determine uh, and the quality of, uh, uh, of the construction of the compounds and, uh, and, and then appreciating the improvements we were making. You know, early on, you know, especially in the mid 60s, we didn't have to have a new car from year to year. We were improving so much in the performance of the tire that um, it was the percentage you could not even gain as much by having a new redesigned car. So there was that much improvement. And uh, we went through a fascinating period there because, uh, you know, it was even, we went from uh, cross bike construction even to, to radio. And I was part of all of that and, uh, and recognizing the behavior and the benefits that you receive from all of that. And, and I remember when the, uh, you remember when the first white oval tires came out for the passenger cars, I, right. test, I was testing at Raceway Park, you know, in a Chevy Camaro, you know, the white ovals uh, against some of the older, you know, like the Firestone 500 even. And the, the amount of the performance gain on the stability of those tires at that time was just phenomenal. So from there, all of these improvements, all these things that uh, uh, they were still, you know, we're still in, in, in its infancy of a lot of the technology. Um, and give me a, just a special appreciation of uh, what this, uh, you know, development of, you know, the thinking and, and the, the effort of all the engineers, you know, behind improving the breed. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I just, I know that the young drivers cannot have that appreciation. So, uh, from that, and many times I wish I would have born, be born much later, you know, to take advantage <laughs> of what we have today. But... <laughs> I wouldn't trade my life for anything only because I've had those experiences and they were just so incredibly, incredibly interesting. Uh, so again, I, um, I, I, I owe Firestone a lot as far as uh, what I've learned uh, because of uh, the opportunity I have with this company. I remember Al Spires would come into my office and say, hey, on this latest testing, uh, we've taken two sets, two one hundred thousandths of a second or whatever off the, the speed on a lap. And I go, oh, wow, what's that big deal? No, no, you don't understand. That's a big deal. Big deal. <laughs> yeah. So now I get it. I get it. Let's talk about family for a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when you're driving in the IndyCar series, you're going over 200 miles an hour. You raced up against Al Unser, Emerson and Fittipaldi, but you also raced up against your son, Michael, for many years. How different is it when you see Michael coming up on your left side versus AJ Foyd? I mean, how do you react? Well, uh, obviously, uh, for one thing, uh, I, I was thinking uh, you better be careful, you know, not to touch the <laughs> wheel. <laughs> and uh, but um, I don't think he was hearing me because uh, uh, Michael was really, uh, uh, you know, he he was he was a great little racer, and um, and uh, and he was so extremely competitive and. When he was behind you, uh, you knew it. And uh, and I, rem I remember, I gotta, I gotta tell you a story. I remember the first competitive pass that he made on me for the lead uh, at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. <clears throat> um, he nudged his way through a hairpin. And uh, you know, my wife, Deanne, used to just go crazy about those things, you know, if we touch yeah. wheels or something. Uh, it was not dangerous, but it was, you know, it was just actually a, a bit rude. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so he goes by me for the lead, and uh, and I was actually disturbed, you know. I said, "Top on it," and then I think in the same in the same breath, I figured, "Well, that's my boy." You yeah. know, so that was a double-edged sword there. But um, we had some great times together. You know, uh, I'll give you some statistics. In IndyCar, right. Michael and I were on podium. That means one, two, three, 15 times during the career. And okay. uh, we, we started on, on the front row 10 times and uh, we finished first and second five times. So um, we had some great times obviously as a family. And uh, to answer your question as a family, it is something special, of course. And uh, I've had my other son, Jeff, on the same track with me. I had my nephew, John, 
on the same track with me in an IndyCar. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 91, uh, the, uh, the podium in Milwaukee, which is usually the race after Indianapolis, it was uh, Michael won, my nephew John was second, I was third. It was an all and ready podium. Uh, I have other stories about that, you know, but uh, so as a family, uh, we have so much to be proud of. And me as a, as a dad, I guess uh, with my brother, we are the ones that started this mess, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, you know, believe it or not, uh, between the two of us, my twin brother, uh, we had four race drivers on each side of the family. There were eight of us that um, had been in racing. And, uh, you know, in 91 and 92, there were four of us, four Andretti's, that qualified for the Indy 500, which never happened before to the same family or since. You know, so again, you know, looking back, uh, there were many, many, you know, precious moments, as you can imagine. Uh, these are things that uh, you can't even, uh, you could never design, you know, okay, we hope this is going to happen. They either happen or they don't, but they happen to us. Yeah, you know, and I saw that uh, Drive Like Andretti uh, that showed that Happy Father's Day gift, I guess, uh, where you came right to the finish line there, and and that was the closest uh, race in, in IndyCar history at the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was uh, actually... Uh, the, as the race was uh, winding down, uh, I had pretty much settled for a second. I couldn't catch Michael. And about three laps to go, I s hear the screams in my radio. <laughs> my engineer says, uh, Michael's having a fuel pickup problem. And uh, so, man, I just I stood up on that seat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We're coming down for the drag for the, at the finish line. And, uh, and his car coughed just enough. I beat him by actually was at the moment they said seven one thousands of a second some other pr people said it's impossible and they turned into seven one hundreds but even then i mean i have photos where it shows like two inches basically i beat him at 180 miles an hour and <laughs> so we were on podium and uh, michael obviously wasn't very happy and someone said to michael this is a uh, hey mike lighten up it's father's day today and michael <laughs> said, oh Happy Father's Day, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. That's a yeah, great story. Great moment. But, oh, my um, God. Yeah, you know, we have a photo. If the photo finish. It's a, and uh, I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me. We're both, you know, I said, okay, I want, I want. He thought he won. I said, no, I won. <laughs> was that <laughs> close? Uh, that was just awesome. So, Mario, there's uh, – there's no doubt you're a living legend. In uh, 2016, you were added to the living legend list in the Library of Congress. W what do you think about this honor and the impact your career has had on American life? Well, you know, as, as you can imagine, I mean, <clears throat> any kind of recognition such as that is uh, something uh, very meaningful indeed, uh, especially uh, I think. At that point, at least, you know, I was the only one from motorsports to uh, receive this uh, this honor, and um, and again, it's all one of those things that, uh, uh, gosh, I mean, you never you would never think that, that that would ever happen, but when it does, and then you look at the uh, the, the the roster of the people that uh, have received the same honor, you're you're in really pretty interesting company, quite honestly. So, yeah, it was. Uh, was something that very, very, uh, very special indeed. That's the only way I can put it. Well, congratulations on that. Mario, as I said earlier, you've raced in five decades and won 111 races. You won the Indy 500 and the Daytona 500 on Firestone Tires and then became an F1 world champion. The list goes on and on. And even though you retired from racing in 1994, you still have tons of projects you're working on all the time and you've never stopped reinventing yourself in different stages of your life. What does the intense drive, where does this intense drive come from? Well, actually from a pure desire, uh, I think, um, uh, you, you know, I always felt that, um, I always tried to challenge myself. Uh, quite honestly, that's, that's the environment that I've lived in, you know, throughout my professional life. And, um, and I found that, uh, you know, something, uh, uh, dream big, you know, uh, every, uh, every goal that I had was very ambitious. And, um, as, as you said, when I stepped out of the cockpit, 
uh, there was uh, there were some business opportunities, and uh, along the way, I've learned certain things such as you know what is the formula that really works to have a great team together, to the team that gets it done, and that's what we uh, use in our business. You know, basically uh, try to hire the the best people you could find. You know, to do the specific job that uh, uh, that uh, are obviously specialties. You know, they're specialized in that, and uh, and reward the people, and also and also have always something to look uh, forward to. Uh, and um, uh, so, as far as the bonuses or anything else, you know, uh, so uh, that's how we operate, and that's how the uh, I've seen smooth operating. Oper- in operations in, in our sport run. And, and it's the same thing. Our sport is, okay, sport, but it's a business. And, um, and I think um, a lot of the, the, the same formulas worked. And, uh, and again, it's, but it's all about just the, the, the motivation is something that uh, comes naturally if, it's, if you're really enjoying what you're doing. If you're enjoying what you're doing and, uh, and you have your sights, your mindset at accomplishing something, Achieving right. something, uh, it's you know you can never ask anyone to be motivated. Uh, it's either there or it's not. <clears throat> yeah, and and you know what you said about having the best people around you. You know, I I, I remember <laughs> learning from you throughout my career. Same thing. It's it's about having good people around you to help you with your endeavors, and you've done a great job with that. Congratulations again. Oh, thank you. Obviously, uh, some things worked. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you're a fan of opera. OK, you've always shared that with me. And growing up in Italy, opera was something you heard on the radio all the time. And, you know, you've had this lifelong love. So what's a better sound, Mario, listening to opera or the roar of a race car? Oh, that's uh, that's depends. Depends what side of the bed I get out in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good answer. Yeah, of course. Uh, no, I uh, <clears throat> when we were in the refugee camp in Luca, uh, my dad was getting the odd jobs and so forth. And uh, and uh, during the opera season, they were looking for extras. And uh, so he, he, even my grandfather, were getting some jobs as extras at the opera house. So and uh, then they were getting some tickets for the peanut gallery. And so that's that's where we would go. And I had seen just some of the major operas, you know, even as a young lad. And um, how can you not fall in love with opera music, you know? So uh, if you delve into it, uh, if you really, um, you know, take the time uh, to, to, to explore it, um, you, it's easy to become a fan. And um, and that's why that's why I did. And I uh, still am, of course. No, yeah, it's great to love. Great love. So you were once asked, what six people would you invite to dinner? And I believe you said you'd invite Mikhail Gorbachev, you'd invite Puccini, who wrote some of your favorite operas, as well as Michelangelo, Julius Cesar, Lady Gaga, Ellen DeGeneres, and Prince Harry. I mean, help me with this, buddy. What, what's, what's this all about? Well, hoping that one of them would pick up the check. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. No, you got to have something else there. Well, you know, these are individuals that uh, would uh, really make for some interesting conversation, don't you think? Coming from oh, different right. paths of life. And uh, that's, that's really what, uh, you know, what uh, look at, uh, for instance, like Lady Gaga rode with me in the 100th anniversary of the Indy 500. And back here, the car we started at 500. And she was quite the hoot. You know, she, she was <laughs> very interesting. And, uh, but we didn't have dinner together. And uh, uh, so, uh, can you imagine her uh, alongside Gorbachev? Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. And then we uh, we throw in the Pope uh, yeah. somewhere, and then bring in Johnny G there to uh, <laughs> to mediate uh, the conversation. Wouldn't that be something? That'd be very great. <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd enjoy that. Yeah, no, I really would. Okay, now it's all coming together. I, I get, I get it, I get it. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, hopefully, if you ever had that opportunity to bring some people together, I'll be there for you. But you'll be invited. You'll be invited. You'll be invited. Thank you. So, one of your dearest friends was a legendary Paul Newman. Can you share a memory with him? Because I know you worked with him for many, many years. Well, I have so many memories of uh, of Paul. Paul was really 
a wonderful person to be around. I mean, we became uh, closer friends than a lot of people would think because uh, not just at the racetrack, but uh, off the track. And I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, he, uh, he would, a couple of times he came up to a place. I have a lake uh, about 70 miles from home here. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it was a small resort area that I, I bought many, many years ago. Anyway, so he would arrive there and I have every toy imaginable there as far as water toys. And, uh, and he was always uh, intrigued by anything that's complicated. You know, whenever I say, you know what, uh, maybe you stay off of this one because it takes a while to get the hang of it and so forth. And uh, I have a, <clears throat> and I had a, a, a surf jet, a surf, like a surfboard with the, with the engine on, which I still have. And huh? uh, you're on the surfboard up there and uh, with the engine, you can cruise at about 30, 35 miles an hour on the surfboard. And uh, so and not too many people can master that. So anyway, quickly, he was out there for about two hours and he was getting on and flying off and so forth. And finally, it was dinner time and he's out there in the middle of the lake. So uh, <laughs> and he, he went overboard again and uh, I ride there with a jet ski and uh, and he's and he's got blood all over his face. So he uh, when he flipped over the bow, he put a cut on his forehead, you know, but, we, you know, when you're in the water and blood, you don't know what it is. So I said, right. Paul, you're all right. Yeah, I'm all right. You know, and he was doing like <laughs> this. So he spread all over his face. Anyway, so I towed him back to the beach. And uh, by then he had blood all over his chest and everything. And I said, what in the world, you know? I said, don't touch it. Don't touch it. I said, so uh, he and I, I said, let's walk up to the cabin. And you just hang on to my shoulder. And typically, you know, he's an actor. So we're going up there. He's got blood all over him. And, I go, and, and he goes, huh, huh. so we arrive, we open the door, and all the ladies were passing out. <laughs> and uh, and Joanne, his wife, Joanne was up there rolling her eyes because she, she knew him. You know, it was a joke. But he was that kind of a guy, you know. I, I had so many stories like that. We had so much fun <laughs> on the side, just even – uh, on the, at the racetrack, everything was serious stuff, and he was uh, all in. Uh, a great guy, great individual, a great part of my life because I had met him in 1967. We were not in there when I, I was uh, instrumental in putting him together with the uh, car house, uh, you know, to field the team that uh, that I joined in 1983. And, uh, and we won 18 IndyCar races together. After wow. I came out of Formula One, and um, and I ended my career with them, you know, with uh, Newman Haas. Um, but again, like I said, he was jam of a guy, wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah, those are awesome stories. Awesome stories. So I'm going to wrap this podcast up, and I really want to thank you, Mario, um, for being one of my first podcast uh, uh, interviewees on Johnny G and Friend, and and uh, I really want to thank for all the great stories you shared with us today. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. The best way to experience something in life is for yourself. And Firestone tires were built for getting out there, for three-day weekends, and for testing the waters. Try Firestone tires for 90 days. If you're not fully satisfied, we'll refund or replace. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone.